Next, uh, next main talk. So uh, Stan will be talking about uh, mobile sensors. Yeah. Um, I think that's a topic that we've not yet seen. Uh, so that's good. Um, yeah. Okay. Take the stage. Uh, yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Stan. I uh, work at uh, the ACA, ACA group, um, and uh, my talk will be about uh, how to detect the arrival of uh, a trains at the platform and their departure using accelerometer data, but the focus will be more about the process instead of uh, the final solution on how did we get uh, to that point. The journey uh, starts with uh, our customer, as in CB. Um, we had an issue with, with uh, that they only have approximate data about uh, when their trains arrive at platforms, uh, whenever they departed. They don't have any statistical data from that because they get that data from InfraBell and they uh, <laughs> don't deliver uh, very good quality of data. Um, so they came to us. Uh, we were developing the mobile application for the departure procedure. Hey, can you help us with that uh, and investigate that? Um, to tackle this problem, um, the main process was actually using uh, the scientific methods. It's just actually a fancy name for six simple steps on how do you systematically tackle a uh, problem to try and get to your solution the fastest. Um, the first step is just, what is my problem? Identify it. The second step is analyze the problem, look what known truths do we have, uh, what things are we looking at, what properties does our problem have. You form a hypothesis. Um, what solution are we going to try? And uh, uh, what, what solution are we going to try to solve our problem? You test the hypothesis later on. Um, so you perform an experiment. And out of that experiment comes data. So you analyze that data. And with that data, you can form conclusions. It's as simple as that. Uh, if you're lucky, in the first pass, you get to your solution. If you're unlucky, like most of the time, it becomes more complex. You'll need to do a few iterations of this. Um, so their question, uh, we have only have approximate data. Please fix this. Uh, isn't something we really can work with. Um, so we had a little bit of talk with them. What's the actual problem? What do you need? And we came to. Um, the question, is it possible uh, to detect the arrival and departure of a train at the platform with a good time resolution? Because they actually want to know it in, within a few seconds and not like it has been here for like five minutes ago or something like that. And the limitation is using a smartphone because we were developing the mobile application. We can, of course, enrich it with other info, but uh, that was our main goal. Then you have your second step, the problem analysis. Um, can we measure our problem? Can we quantify it? What data do we need? What properties do we have? What known truths do we have? Do we have experience with GPS? Do we have experience uh, with sensor data? Do we have experience with a few things that can help us solve the problem? And in this case, it's just eh, what factors do, do play a role for our research question? And it is um, looking at the properties. So we're looking at arrival and departure at a platform. What does it actually mean? It's arrival at a platform is your position becomes at the platform. So if you have a location, a GPS coordinate at your platform. The velocity becomes zero, your train comes to a standstill. The departure is you're no longer at the platform and your velocity is no longer zero because your train is leaving. Um, so we know what we're, we're looking at and then what things can we use for that? What capabilities does our smartphone have? Basic things, we have GPS, contains coordinates, it contains velocity, so we might be able to do some things with that. So we try to form a hypothesis, it's just an educated prediction. Uh, what are we going to try to do? What is our proposed solution? Um, but the important part is we should be able to prove or disprove our hypothesis, because if we cannot do that, we can form a conclusion, so we do not know if we have solved our uh, problem. It should be measurable just because you need to prove it. It should be objective so that you do not bias your hypothesis towards your answer uh, and specific because you need to be able to test it. So 
the hypothesis we formed based on our analysis uh, is that if we just collect the position and velocity using GPS, we can reliably determine our arrival at uh, the platform. <coughs> then the next step is, okay, we need to test our hypothesis. Can we prove that it really works? So we design an experiment, we confirm or in the end want to confirm or reject our hypo hypothesis. Um, but as I said before, it requires measurable uh, results. So they should be fair and objective. Uh, you need to take into account that if you, most of often, if you try to prove your hypothesis, you're going to bias your re results because you're trying to look for the answer. But actually, it's often more opportune to try and disproving your hypothesis. Find the edge cases where it doesn't work. Maybe it's okay if it doesn't work for the, those edge cases, but try and look, look for them. Uh, just make sure that if you test things, that your data represents the reality and fo focus only on the things you want to test. Forget about everything on the, on the side. You're looking at your hypothesis, the thing you truly want to prove. So in this case, uh, we designed an experiment. Um, was how do we detect uh, that you're present at the platform? As I said before, you have your location at the platform. Um, we used things like bounding boxes. If you enter the bounding box, you're at the platform. If you leave the bounding box, you're uh, outside of the platform. Around the stations, you here you see two binding bo boxes. That is just a Schmidt trigger, uh, which ensures some stability in if you enter or leave uh, your um, your region to prevent uh, a lot of fluctuations. Then, uh, as we were only developing an Android application, uh, we just used a few location provider from Android, just because it already gives us out of the box some very good combination of GPS, Wi-Fi, and everything like that. So we get the uh, good enough um, location data. Uh, and uh, because we did, before this question, we did already did a proof of concept for, for them. We knew we had some problems with having GPS on a train because you're in a Faraday cage, you get reflection, you don't have GPS signal. Uh, si signal might be spot spotty. Um, so we introduced a few extra uh, tools to help us. Um, the things we tried uh, were a Kalman filter, a route mapping or route snapping filter, and a train model filter. I'll, in short, explain what those were. Uh, the Kalman filter we introduced uh, because we have some GPS drift and we have especially some GPS jumps that you are jumping around on your track. Um, so the Kalman filter, where there we combined uh, measurements over time of two different sources. You have your fuse location provider, but you also have accelerometer data together with a rotation vector. Um, where in the first step, so originally we had a location, uh, then you get accelerometer data and you're gonna use that to predict where am I gonna be, but we do not use that point yet, is we start using the point on the next time we get a, a location update. Um, then at that time, we're gonna combine our predicted results with the one we got from the fuse location provider. Uh, and then based on how sure we are of each value, uh, yeah, we, ha we have a weighted average just to stabilize our GPS. Uh, that had some very good results. Um, the second part uh, is a right snapping filter. We have the advantage, we have a train, so we know we were on the track. So we just uh, take our coordinate and say it's on the right, the nearest point on the right. Uh, and this fixes some signal reflection we have from buildings that sometimes are a kilometer away and we get it consistently next to the track. So it helps, helped us a lot to detect the stations. Uh, and the last part is the train model filter. It's just actually trying to have a representation of the physical limits of our train. How fast can it go? How, uh, what's the turn radius? What's the maximum speed it can go through, through a corner? Um, this actually made our results worse instead of better. So we threw that out in the end. Um, but those are the things we uh, used within our experiment. Um, then, of course, we're gonna analyze the data. And during the analysis, it's, uh, did we prove our hypothesis? Uh, are there any remaining issues? What new insights do, do we have? Have we learned some things? Do we need to tackle uh, some new problems that arose? Uh, 
Also important, communicate re your results. So document what you see, document how you interpret interpreted them. Uh, because in three years, you will no longer know what you did or the next developer especially doesn't know what you did. Uh, and also at that time, you can assess the likelihood that going further with your solution or the path you're going through will deliver a result or it uh, totally doesn't. In this case, um, I wrote, wrote eh, the application, did, did some tests, came to the conclusion what the best combination of filters was. Um, and the results we had here were very good. Uh, we can detect our station arrival. It was very stable. Uh, we used the combination, as said before, the Schmidt trigger ensures stability, except there are some remaining issues. Um, because in our original research question, it, uh, it was important that we had a very good time resolution because we want to know that we're at the platform. And sometimes you don't get any GPS data until the train guard leaves the train and then possibly uh, hits up a GPS satellite and then suddenly it works. The velocity where we depended on um, was totally unreliable. I had times I had it constantly, at times I, had, I didn't have it for hours. So I couldn't use the velocity um, from our uh, fuse location provider because it depends on what the source is the data comes from. Um, so yeah, that's an issue. So it's back to the drawing boards. You're, we're going to go again through the cycle. Um, and the identification of the problem here is what were the issues from our remaining issues from the previous part that we just have miss, are missing a good time resolution. So we need to analyze our problem again and uh, look how we can continue further. Um, at that time, we had a master student at uh, our company uh, who was doing some uh, basic uh, machine learning uh, using a naive base classifier. Uh, which is just a probabilistic model uh, to determine, uh, to predict what the outcome is. Um, and he had some good results uh, with using accelerometer data to determine if you're on foot, by bike, by car. He had a 96% accuracy. We have a high frequency, good time resolution. So for us, it looked like a viable path uh, to go through. Um, so uh, we, use, we previously defined the being at a platform uh, based on the coordinates or based on having zero velocity. But now it's more uh, the idea of your train guard is walking around on the platform and in the train is, is still walking around, but you also have your train that's in motion. So we might be able to start looking at uh, the accel acceleration of, that, of the device he's holding uh, to determine uh, if he's there. So this translates to a walking acceleration pattern and a superposition of walking and the train in motion. Um, so our hypothesis was um, if we use a naive base classifier, uh, we can differentiate between walking and uh, walking and its superposition uh, with a train in motion. Uh, so it's time to, uh, to test this hypothesis that we can really use it. Um, and that starts, of course, starts with training the model. Um, I did build a basic mobile application to gather the data where I could also classify it. Hey, we're driving. Hey, we're at the platform. Uh, it's as easy as that. I did the analysis just in Python. <coughs> uh, I looked at, so the naive base classifier uses different properties of your data uh, you can use to predict your results. So I tried a lot of them. Uh, I also included GPS in the end, uh, the velocity calculation on how far are we from the station. Um, but the uh, results weren't very good. Uh, we're, we're really lacking accuracy. Uh, what you see here on the right is the confusion matrix. Uh, you have the true label on the left, at the bottom the predicted label. Um, while driving, we can detect that very well. We have 94% accuracy. Uh, except when you're at the platform, some, half the time it says you're at the platform and half the time it says you're still driving. So we, have, we can't do anything with that. Uh, I did some box plots of the, of the data we had, uh, of the different features. There was just too much overlap. So it was the, the model itself was too simple to try and find the patterns that are in uh, our accelerometer data. 
Also, just based on the data we looked at and some further thinking and everything like that, it's we are missing the changing of the velocity going to zero, changing the velocity uh, starting from zero again, uh, moving away from the platform. So it's missing the transient nature of, it, of all those things. Um, so we were trying to go and look uh, at that info. Um, well, so probabilistic models miss the transient nature of uh, arrival and departure. Um, and so our problem analysis is we got from our previous two cycles, uh, we had our probabilistic models like the naive base classifier cannot, cannot differentiate between the, the patterns um, and the velocity and the position alone aren't good as well. Uh, because we're missing time resolution. Um, but because I was busy with also looking at what data do, do, do we have, uh, I started getting some ideas that I might just be able to do some basic signal processing of our data. And we'll see in the end where we're going to get uh, if I find something different uh, where we can do this. Um, so uh, the transient nature is just the deceleration by, followed by a period of no acceleration and the departure is acceleration preceded by a period of no acceleration. So we might want to start looking if we can see, find that back in our data. Um, and our hypothesis here was that we can for, form an algorithm which allows us to do something with it. We didn't have an ex exact idea yet because it was, it was completely new terrain for us. Uh, but we had the idea that because we were using accelerometer data, we have good time resolution. We're expecting that we find the patterns back. So um, we try and form an experiment or at the meantime, design your uh, algorithm um, to uh, detect the arrival and departure. Um, here uh, in the experiment, I just used the data I gathered before. I'm lazy, I'm not gonna do that again. Uh, and I'm just going to start also in just in Python, try and uh, do some signal processing and see if we can improve on the data. And we'll go through eight simple steps uh, in the next slide, uh, in the next eight to nine slides, um, to see how we got to, to the final result. Um, maybe first, what do you see here? Um, the green parts are we're driving, the red parts are we're stopped. So red part, we're at the platform, green, we're driving. Um, on the y-axis, you have the magnitude, so how big is our acceleration? On the x-axis, it's what sample count was this? What is the index? So it's just, it's similar to time, just without the how big our time resolution is. Um, if we look at this data, uh, I see a curve with a lot of fluctuations, but there wasn't really anything we could do with it yet. Um, but because we knew we were looking at something similar to velocity, it was actually just the idea, let's sum it up and see it approximates something that feels like velocity. So let's just sum it up and see what happens. Um, and then you get uh, a curve that, that looks like this. Um, okay, there's no, the velocity doesn't become zero or constant in our stopped regions, it keeps going down. Um, but if you look closer at the data, I hope it's visible, uh, is you see, see changes in the, in the curvature uh, of your slope. So your slope goes down, then it drops, and then it goes down again with a constant value. And here, especially on arrival, it goes down a lot when you arrive, and then it becomes uh, less steep. Um, so the slow, slope of your curvature, you're looking at that. So mathematically speaking, it's just the gradient. Um, so we can try and represent it by taking the gradient. Um, but if we do that with our data, um, we, what you see here is the red values are the, uh, is the original data and the blue values are the, um, the gradient. So we get our original data back, which is because we have micro changes in our data. We have a lot of noise in there, so it's not unlogical that we are not seeing anything here. But we can just smooth out our uh, data by um, taking a moving average. Just take one second of data uh, and average everything out. So it's your uh, changes, change in acceleration becomes a lot smoother. And if you then take the gradient, uh, 
you get something better. Uh, you have three, here you have the three channels in your accelerometer data. You have the X, Y, and Z channel, just the axes. Uh, and we didn't care about the orientation at that point. Um, but you can start seeing that for, especially for the red curve, it's centered around zero. Uh, in the stopped region, we do not see a lot of uh, acceleration there uh, in the gradient. Uh, the blue one isn't centered around zero, but that's because we had a constant slope. So that's the drift in our velocity. In the green one, we have some periodic data, probably some electronic noise or something that's in there. We're detecting some things that aren't really acceleration. Um, but we would like to have them all centered around zero. I would like to have the, the large period ones uh, removed. So I just introduced a high pass filter that's just filtering out everything with a, with a very large period. Uh, they, are, they are just thrown out. And now everything is, uh, when you're stopped, everything is centered around zero. They're a lot smaller than when you're driving. You have a lot more fluctuations when you're driving and you see that coming back all the time. Um, as I said before, I don't care about orientation, so I'm just going to take the absolute value and sum up everything and just want to work with the total acceleration uh, we have at the time. Uh, and every, then you have a curve that looks like this. Um, so again, it, just be the, it becomes even more noticeable that they're a lot smaller when you're stopped. So now it becomes quite easy. Just um, take a cutoff throw everything that's a lower value at some point, throw it out. And then now I can really tell my program what it needs to do. Um, I have a period, eh? arrival was deceleration followed by a period of no acceleration. Uh, departure is having no acceleration and a period uh, of acceleration. And that's what we see here. You just l look, do I have data at this point? Yes, okay, look in the future. If, do I have for a period of, say, 30 seconds, because we know how long a departure procedure takes, do we have a period of 30 seconds where there's no acceleration? Yes, okay, then we're arrived. Uh, the same again uh, at the end. Uh, if you're departing, you have data, look before it. We have a period of 30 seconds with no acceleration. Okay, we, we have uh, departed. Then you get, uh, this is the data that comes out of that s simple calculation. Uh, plus one is departure, minus one is arrival. Um, you have some false positives, uh, which isn't terrible. We can work with that. We have other data. False negatives would be worse because we cannot generate data, uh, which we do not have, but we can throw data away uh, based on analysis, based on the GPS, for example. Uh, we can throw this out. Um, so we have no direct dependency on GPS. Maybe for cleaning up our data we have, but so we're not, our time resolution becomes good because we take uh, data that uses sensor data that uh, has a very high frequency. So we have good time resolution. We, have, we had no false negatives in all the data I tested. Um, false positives we can remove, so that's good. The analysis can be done on device. Um, we're not using it to detect the arrival for the departure procedure. We are using it for statistical data afterwards. So it doesn't matter that we have to wait 30 seconds for that. Um, and we just need a few basic signal processing tools uh, to detect your arrival. So our conclusion is it is possible to do it. Um, but the thing I hope you take the most from this presentation is just follow a few simple steps uh, where you identify your problem, analyze it, form a theory, test that theory, analyze it, conclude on it. Um, that you can do that for big steps, but you can also do it for smaller problems if you're debugging. It doesn't, you don't have to write everything down, but it's, it's a mindset you can use to uh, get to the end, uh, in the end to your solution. Uh, that's it, thank you for your uh,